Hello, and welcome to The Entrepreneurial Musician, a coaching service podcast and blog preparing today's musicians for tomorrow's realities. This is TEM 228 titled The McCain Duo. Thank you to Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for TEM. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hits artist model tuba mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. As you are about to hear, I had an absolutely delightful conversation with the McCain duo, who are a married performing and teaching couple. Uh, Dr. Artina McCain is assistant professor of music and coordinator of piano studies at the University of Memphis. And Dr. Martin McCain is artist slash teacher of trombone and professor of music at Texas State University. Uh, they performed over the world, including Mahito University in Bangkok, the University of Toronto, uh, radio television, Hong Kong, uh, they do a lot of really wonderful stuff. Uh, it's very, it's, it's interesting to me. It's remarkable. They work with composers to create their own works. I think they have a, a very important voice in terms of clinics and they talk about goal setting and auditions and you're about to hear all about this, but I think you're going to really like this. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, coming in early 2021, there are going to be some TEM classes and workshops, which are going to be available through TEM.FM, through our website. So please stay tuned for that. The YouTube channel just got over 100 subscribers. It's uh, it's growing slowly, uh, and I'm still getting way many times over more listeners than uh, than viewers of the episodes on YouTube. I mean, like most of the episodes only have like 20 views right now. And the, uh, the, you know, the, the listens are many times X more than that. But um, the, I am, you know, you're growing it slowly, right? You got to be patient. You can't just jump to a new platform and then expect there to be instant success. But I actually posted a Facebook post. I went from 68 to 140 likes in like two days or not like subscribers. So uh, come join me, help me get to 150. Uh, I'm getting close to that one. So, and the other one is it's a race to 150. I'm at 146 ratings on Apple Podcasts, and I'm trying to get to 150. So thank you in advance if you can take a few minutes to help me get over the hump there. So without further ado, let us get to the conversation that I had with the McCain duo. And today on The Entrepreneurial Musician, I am joined by the McCain duo, which is comprised of Dr. McCain and Dr. McCain. Uh, I'm not sure which one I just, uh, let's say I, I put Artina first, Martin. It's alphabetical. It's it's polite. So, uh, but no, we, these are two doctors who are, and they are socially distancing because they live together because they are married. And they also <laughs> happen to be a fantastic creative force as a duo. It is wonderful to have you both. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> yeah, this should be fun. We interviewed Martin for the Brass Junkies. I, especially during the pandemic, like, was it during the pandemic or before it? I don't even remember when. It was like this time last year. Okay. So it was a year ago. We've been doing that just long enough and I'm just old enough that if you had told me it was three years ago, that would surprise me, but I wouldn't rule it out. And then if you had told me it was like two months ago, I'd be like, sure. I, yeah, it's just all kind of like a. It's all a blur. Don't get old. Um, so uh, Dr. Artina McCain is an uh, assistant professor of music and coordinator of piano studies at the University of Memphis. And Dr. Martin McCain is artist slash teacher of trombone and professor of music at Texas State University. Uh, the duo has performed all over the world, including at Mahito University, where I've actually done a few residencies there. Uh, maybe, maybe it was two or three, but uh, with Boston Brass back in the day, that's a wonderful, wonderful school. Uh, that's in Bangkok and, uh, and also at the University of Toronto and uh, Radio Television Hong Kong. And in addition to their live performances, they also host a series called Elevate with the McCain Duo, which is, uh, you know, clinics on goal setting and auditions and expanded career options for musicians and arts entrepreneurship. So you all have a, a wide 
a wide range of offerings, which is which is very cool. Which I want to unpack all that, but uh, and this is basically any of this is for either of you. But what? How did the the duo start? Like, whose idea was it? How long did it go from like the? We can kind of unpack it, but like the idea to an actual thing. Like the origin stories really fascinate me because I find that all artists that are at the level that you two are at uh, individually have lots of great ideas. But there's not that many that actually become things, and here we are. So, what um, what is the origin story for McCain duo? Ooh, it would be cool to hear this from two different perspectives. Oh. I should leave the room. <laughs> should I? Should I'll I? Come I was back. Just... <laughs> it's like the newlywed game. I like yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Really, really, Martin. Artina said it was her idea. That's interesting that you said it's your idea. Please tell us more. (laughs) Right. Yeah, Yeah, Lee. Well, I guess we didn't even really say like whose idea it was. It's just like, well, one, we got married, and so um, whose idea was that? (laughs) (laughs) He drafted me into it. (laughs) There There you go. There you go. In a moment of weakness, and here you are, and your your life is peaked with an appearance on TEM. So right. yep, dreams do come true. Sorry, I won't interrupt every five seconds, but it will happen again. I won't. I'm not gonna lie. So, all right. So you got married. Yeah, and then we didn't really play with each other like the first couple. Well, actually, no. What we got married in August. Our first residency gig was in November. And so just a few months later, and like we just build ourselves as the McCain duo, but we didn't really, it's not like what it is now, like where like everything is extremely branded McCain duo. We probably didn't start really branding ourselves as a McCain duo until like maybe five or six years ago. Hmm. But, um, but yeah, like we were doing like university residencies, like that was the first thing, like Artina was great at like writing grants and you got like the NCNA grant. Mm-hmm. So we started doing, um, and you can talk more about that, um, like a lot of school concerts. And we love doing that. Um, just like, just talking about our instruments and just working with like hundreds of kids was just amazing. And, you know, it's fast forwarding. We started doing like the Elevate stuff, um, which has been pretty awesome as well. Like, did you want to get into? Oh, yeah. So my side of the story is Martin took me to lunch and I was hungry. I'm always hungry. And he asked me who I was studying with. We were both, well, I was a DMA student, Martin had finished. And I already knew that was not going the right direction with the trombone player. I know how many notes they play. You brass players play versus pianists, and I was not for it. <laughs> but we 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 make it look hard, especially us low brass players. You know, if either Martin or I can pull off like a, a fast run and it and it sounds relatively effortless, it's like that man is a virtuoso. So right. Whereas, right. you know, piano, you're yeah, it's it will just say it's a little more difficult. So yeah. Right. right. So I say we had a pre- piano prenup. We did not play together pre-marriage or no, and I didn't even remember didn't. that we started two months after he got yeah. me. So um, <laughs> so yeah, we started playing together. Martin's, you know, an awesome bass trombonist and he won me over with playing for some other trombonists, but now I only play with him. <laughs> Look at that. Um, <laughs> Exclusivity agreement. I like it. There's some layers here. Right. And so then, yeah, just in the past three years or so, have we gone into this um, McCain duo Elevate series and more reaching out mentorship and doing programs around not just our performances, but also, you know, social justice issues and how we can help the next generation of musical entrepreneurs. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I want to ask you about grant writing, uh, but we're going to circle back to that. Was the uh, was. I was going to say, was the decision to to brand it, was it a decision or was it an organic thing or was there a conversation or did somebody have a realization or did it just kind of happen? I think it's been happening. Yeah, it's a combination of both. I mean, I was getting invited to do like, you know, it's like the trombone conference things, you know, and so like I was just getting billed as me and she's my accompanist and we weren't really feeling that because... I mean, like I said, she's playing more notes than I am, you know, right. and she like brings so much to the table. And yes. so like, I mean, that was a huge reason why we started actually commissioning more music mm-hmm. because, you know, we wanted like, like the pieces we play, it's not just like bass trombone, like in the spotlight, like there's some killing stuff, you know, that, that she has to play. And so, you know, we wanted to, to get billed like that, like as a group and not like, oh, you know, like piano in the background and, and trombone. Right. 
You can yeah. imagine that's not good for our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do 90% of the work and then you take the credit, honey. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Yeah. right. <laughs> that works okay in like the rest of our world <laughs> when you just hire a pianist. But yeah, when you're married to your pianist, it doesn't work so great. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, it, I don't remember how many years ago it was when I first encountered it, which doesn't mean that it hadn't been around for a long time. But when I first encountered the the movement to stop calling pianists accompanists and to call them collaborative artists and uh, which, which makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, and, and the, and uh, Martin and I have both played for pianists that, that make it really easy to tell a musical story. Cause it's like a, you know, it's, it's together. And then some that make it very, very difficult, you know, and you just kind of, but, but the ones that make it, that make it easy, I mean, are, uh, yeah, at least as much of the show as we are. Right. Um, and so that, that's really interesting that by just calling it a thing, then you, you hardwired, like systemically hardwired the spotlight going over to Artina as well. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. It's, and it's definitely changed my teaching too. Like, like the word accompanist, accompanist is like a bad word in my studio. They know not to say that. And, you know, right. I'm a stickler on, you know, them, getting the music in time and like making it through like collaborative effort and like, you know, they're not just in the background for your recitals. Right. Yeah. That's, that, that that's a, a great lesson to be, uh, to be teaching to them. Uh, and, and also from speaking entrepreneurially, uh, you know, going to a trombone conference and Martin, you are, uh, of course, you're a big name in the trombone world, but when it says McCain duo, you're already going to stand out compared to just the the list of another 15 big name trombone soloists who are playing a solo recital, right? At that point, that's like, that's a thing. Like there's a, a duo or a trio or a quartet. I mean, I tend to, um, I tend to want to go to more of those concerts at a tuba conference than just a long list of tuba recitals. Absolutely. So um, yeah, it's a way to, to differentiate yourself. So Artina, uh, I know that, uh, I don't know this from personal experience, but I know uh, because it's common sense and also I've been told this a lot that it's impossible. I'm not asking you to summarize how to write a good grant in 90 seconds, because if that was possible, then you wouldn't be considered good at it because anybody could be good at it. Right. But um, what is uh, is there kind of like a soundbite piece of advice to even get someone on the right path to to at least attempting right because i'm sure that the secret is to just do it a lot right and to pay attention and to learn but what advice do you have to somebody who wants to get into that yeah you know i will admit andrew i don't think i'm a pro at grant writing at all you know right. that was kind of my my one hit wonder right. <laughs> there <laughs> um but i do think you know when i was going through that process was to look for things that were very specific to you know myself or whoever is writing very specific to yourself and your own personal mission mm -hmm. and then i think it makes it easy right because you already believe in what you're doing um who you are resonates with the people who are reviewing the grant and so then it's not so much of this mystery of you know how do i write the grant because your mission and who you are lines up with what that organization is looking for that's a that's a very good, that was less than 90 seconds. So yeah, <laughs> my 90 second sound bites are like eight minutes long. Like yours was like 35 seconds. You're like, next question. That was awesome. <laughs> so essentially what you just said was be genuine, but you put it in a much more tangible, actionable way. Cause like, what does being genuine mean? I mean, we all know, but it, that can be kind of a nebulous, like, you know, can you be a little more genuine with that Rochu etude, Martin? It's like, what, what do you do? You want it louder, softer? You know, like what are you what are you talking right. about? Uh, but but if you're true to yourself, then that comes through in the grant uh, application. Absolutely, you yeah. know, for you know the specific grant that Martin mentioned, which we went and played for children at different elementary school schools, and I don't want to say rural Texas because it's right outside of Austin, but I guess to people who live in Austin, now it's rural, but it's like 20 minutes, <laughs> um, was you know that we wanted to bring this collection of American music to these kids that don't get too many school concerts. Um, they were actually outside of the region where um, there's actually an institution there that does a lot of school concerts, but these kids fell outside of that, um, you know, that mile radius. 
Yes. So we were going to do that. So it's already a win. We were musicians. We have, um, you know, degrees and different accolades. And so it wasn't really a hard sell. It's like, oh, okay. They're going to give us something that we don't have and that we need. So I think if you go at it from that perspective, you can have a lot of success in whatever grants you're looking for. Sounds like you were intentional as well. The fact that you are aware, because it's certainly possible to apply for that grant and not realize that this area was outside of the radius of this pre-existing organization that already does this kind of thing. So you did some research and found a place where there was maybe a little bit of daylight already, and then you just pushed the rest of the door open. Exactly. Yes. And I think, you know, probably a lot of people are trying to go through the same door. The mm -hmm. back door is a really great place to hang out. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going there. <laughs> yeah. I Anytime that uh, it hasn't happened a lot on the, the podcast, but anytime that I talk with a guest about grant writing, I always mention that I'm on the board of directors for the Mockingbird Foundation. And I'm specifically on the, the grant making committee and we review a lot of grants and it's uh it's amazing the how low the percentage and we get a it's a the organization brings uh helps provide music education resources for underserved populations and uh it's we get a depressing number of applicants i mean depressing number of applicants but it's amazing the the how low the percentages of people who actually look at our mission specifically and then speak genuinely to themselves and speak directly to what we do. The good news, though, there is that you can instantly set yourself into at least the pile that's going to get seriously considered, um, which is like 10 percent of the grants. I mean, you know, and, and we we probably fund one percent. So you're still only but but obviously going 10 to one is easier than going 100 to one. Uh, and it sounds like you checked every one of those boxes where you did the research, you knew who you were applying to and you then wrote a great proposal. So you you already had one foot in the door. Exactly. Yeah, I like how you just broke that down, actually, <laughs> of, of looking at the mission. You're right. I mean, even not related to grants, other things that we do, like job applications yeah. or, you know, other, um, you know, I'm on some boards for conferences and just thinking like, wow, a lot of these people don't know what this conference is. <laughs> you know? right. They didn't even go to the main page of the website. So yeah, that's actually a really relevant point yeah. that you bring up. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I get pitches for from PR people for TEM all the time that just see that it is, uh, you know, that it's a, a highly ranked music business podcast. And it's like basically like, hey, I've got a, for example, hey, I have a client. Uh, they're the McCain duo. They just put out a new album and it'd be great if they could talk about it on your, you know, on your podcast. It's like, well... I don't have people like you two to just talk about your latest album. Not that that wouldn't be interesting. Uh, and obviously you're very, I, you're, you're on the show. That's how worthy you are of being on, you know, as guests. And you're, and this is already crazy helpful with actionable advice and it's awesome. But this, this show isn't to just have you talk about your latest album. And it's just amazing how, how bad most PR pitches or grant applications or conference applications are. It's amazing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Just we got to come back of, for that. <laughs> a little bit of research. <laughs> we'll take out all the names and just yeah. read the proposal. <laughs> I have read some, and I have taken out the names. Uh, I have read some, uh, like especially bad uh, PR. Um, yeah, and they always come from PR professionals, by the way. Wow. Like I would never, you know, I would never make fun of, say, the McCain duo who just kind of does a not great job of, like, you know, of like, but but trying to do it right and then just don't do it right. I don't need it to be slick at all, right? Um, but I'm sure that's not what you're looking for in those conferences either, right? Are you looking for somebody who clearly has somebody who's paid thousands of dollars as a side hustle to write super clean and clear conference applications? Or are you just looking for somebody who's going to make your conference better and serve the people who attend it? Exactly. Yep. Actually, yep. I read some of those and I was like, oh, that's a zero of five. Because yeah. <laughs> it just sounded gross. <laughs> 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 it sounds oh, I, gross. <laughs> I love it. Le, let's talk a little bit about this Elevate with the McCain duo. Um, how did you come up with the idea for that? It's obvious you have lots to say, so I, I would maybe argue that until you did, it was going to happen one way or another because you've got so much to say. But how did that the idea for making that an actual series of things come about? Wow. So we, we just called it just gave it a name just recently, the Elevate series. But we've been doing this video series 
I guess three years now. I think we started in 2017 mm -hmm. and they all started out as 60 second clips because that's what you could put on Instagram at the yeah. time. So we just wanted them to be really short tips. And we felt that, I mean, there's a lot of great music schools that are out there, but we just felt like there was a lot of information that is still not being poured into these students. Like, like simple things like checking emails, like this is how you write a resume, this is how you get a gig, and this is how you keep a gig. Like just little things like that some teachers probably just don't tell their students. And mm -hmm. so we just thought that that was very important just to put that information out there. And then of course, you know, you wanna change with your times and then Instagram created IGTV, which made it a little bit longer. And we started to, you know, incorporate IGTV with YouTube. And so we started making longer videos. The production started getting better. Um, our our um, video people, like they started learning and, you know, getting their product better too, getting better equipment. And as of recently, actually the beginning of, of this year, January, we, we said that we wanted to start doing interviews. So this is before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so like our interviews were actually in-person interviews. And we were thinking about some people that we wanted to interview that weren't, you know, in a close um, radius, mile radius um, with us that, you know, we would probably do in some type of format like this, like way before like March happened. And then when March um, hit and like the pandemic, um, everything shut down we had no choice but to start using this Zoom format. But um, yeah, with the interviews, we just wanted to interview our friends who are killing Famous it. Famous yeah. and awesome and not interviewed enough, man, yeah. at that too, because yeah. the accolades are just too high for so many people of color and they're just not on shows, so yeah. continue. Yeah. And <laughs> And not, <laughs> and not even just famous, like even like up and coming, um, like mm -hmm. kids or not just kids, but up and coming musicians who are killing it, who are awesome that everyone needs to know about too. Yes. And so, so yeah, like that's, that's been fun. And so, um, just seeing how that has evolved, um, this past, this past year and what, well, I guess we had a spring 20 show. We at the summer mm -hmm. yeah summer and we just finished our fall our fall season and so mm -hmm. it's just been cool seeing how that um just the evolution of that in the past 12 months yeah really it's been really quick and i guess it went from instagram and now we're like trying to shove people on youtube but yeah. <laughs> i think they're very stubborn about why isn't this whole show on instagram anymore so if you're still looking for us <laughs> please go follow our new youtube channel that we created during the pandemic <laughs> just for this show <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting getting people to switch platforms. Uh, yeah, it's it's real, and it's Instagram is owned by Facebook, who I I trust as far as I can throw, uh, and uh, and and I'm I'm on it, right? I'm on it. I'm on it every day, uh, and and YouTube is owned by Google, which is not exactly like a mom and pop, like you know, like you know, right. pop up lemonade stand down the street, you know, like oh, she's been there for forty years. It's the best lemonade in town. It's like. For some reason, I trust YouTube a lot to like kind of set up my house much more than I do anything Facebook related. I'm not I'm not sure. I, yeah. I don't know why, because they're both like giant, you know, I don't know. Anyway, like Walmart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like it's like passionately arguing for yeah Walmart versus Amazon. It's kind of like, well, I mean, right. yeah, I guess you could have a passionate like opinion about which one is a better citizen, but that's kind of a weird <laughs> it's like it's kind of a weird debate to be having in in your head. Uh, talk about how cool it is to have a uh, a platform that you've earned over the years, where you get to elevate voices of people that you feel need elevating. Whoa! Well, you know, so many of them don't need our they don't need our help. I mean, we just yeah. had Demondre Thurman; he does not need our help. Right. That was very He's amazing. <laughs> honored that he was on our show but um <laughs> he's too good of a friend of mine to call it to say i'm ever honored to talk to him but uh but he's he's amazing he's he's our i mean as an artist as a as just as a teacher as a performer as a human uh yeah he's he's so uh, he's just he's so well spoken he's so passionate and well spoken and that combination is always really powerful uh yeah he's he's awesome yeah, and he did the whole interview in his car while picking up his oh, no. children and getting yeah. a haircut. I was just like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> 
It's like, he's, he's definitely done this before. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you do this every day. Okay. <laughs> but no, I think what's been really neat, as Martin said, is not only, like you said, you know, just getting to interact with our friends who already have distinguished careers of their own is that opportunity to say, hey, you know, there's this generation of people doing some really cool stuff that maybe people don't know about, or maybe there's these marginalized groups who are also doing really cool stuff maybe people don't know about. And for that to become a theme and, and to have been really well received by so many people yeah it's, been, uh, it's, it's great it's also been nice just we like we learn things like all the time too i mean when we were interviewing her colleague um jonathan Sai at the beginning of the year and i've known jonathan for several years um i had no idea that he was into boxing and i'm a huge boxing fan and so like we hit it off even more i'm like man this is this is awesome so, so yeah i mean you might think you know someone and you learn like new things um, which is great yeah there's something that's powerful about about interviewing people where I you know I first met Artina 29 minutes ago and yet like I you know I, I'm not gonna claim like we're like that we're close or dear friends or I'm expecting a Christmas card next year but you know I'll it's like that tomorrow <laughs> yeah there you go there you go or yeah I, I don't expect it next year I expect it this year yeah it's, we still got four days here uh, but you know, you kind of feel like you get to know someone when it, I guess in a similar way, though, if you're like if you're at, a, I don't know, if you're at Midwest and you like, you know, and Artina and I actually got a chance to talk for 20 minutes like you, you leave that feeling like, you know, it's not like, well, we didn't have a few hours, so I didn't really get to, you know, you really get to know somebody if you talk to them for 20 minutes. So um, that's something that's wonderful about about interviews and to be able to lift voices, like you said, of marginalized uh, groups and individuals and uh, something we try very hard on the, on, on the brass junkies to do is that uh, you know when we when we first started we tried um, and I will admit that I was that it was more on my radar to make sure that there were women that were represented in the interviews early on and we did have we did have people of color as well um, but I, I think in my head the prioritization just it was just unintentional was making sure that there were women first. Uh, and and we were good about that initially, and then uh, and then when we weren't as intentional, it ended up being a whole bunch of people who look like me, <laughs> like you know, and not not like twenty in a row, but but and we actually got a very pointed email that was that was pointed but polite, and they were a hundred percent right. I mean, I wrote them like a seven minute long email response that they received eight minutes after I got the email because it was like. You're right, and ever since then, it's just it's been much more, much more intentional. Because like, yeah, no one needs to have a podcast that like to make sure that like that white male pianists are elevated, right? right. And that, I mean, it just it doesn't need to happen, and that doesn't mean that you don't elevate, uh, you know, any individuals. Like, that's not obviously what you are saying, right? And there are some people that will hear that, and that's on them, and not on you. And you don't you don't know an explanation, but it's it's important. So it's cool that you've not only built a platform, but that you continue to build the platform to to do good with is I, I think is is admirable, and it takes a lot of work, huh? Oh, yeah, it does. And we're learning as we go too. I mean, I mean, if you see, you see like the initial like our steps, even when we started three years ago, like we started in her office and then we you know moved to like right back here where some of the interviews. And so, you know, we, we learn as we go and the next one will be even better than this past season, too. <laughs> we should have a bloopers reel. That would be yeah. funny. Where we started off with our own camera that we didn't know how to oh work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have some of the same, Andrew. Like. <laughs> There's, no, I was polished from day one, Artina. I was just, it was, it was, a, nobody, nobody could understand it. It was just, it was a, just so smooth from day one. No, uh, yeah. Well, and, and, the I think it's important to note that the McCain duo, but even before it was, you know, your your show, um, you know, the Elevate with the McCain duo had an audience of exactly zero people as you hit send the first time, right? Right. Zero. I mean, yeah. and obviously you had a few close friends and maybe some family and you know some close colleagues who watched it pretty quickly, but you had zero subscribers. You had zero, uh, you know, followers on Instagram. That's where everyone starts. Everybody. Yeah. But you just got to do it, right? Right. Exactly. You got to step out exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> so, what is it that you look for in a guest to uh, to to have on that elevate with the McCain duo? Um, I guess we have, you know, a couple categories. Well, one, um, you know, like we're up and coming um, musicians, and so like yes, you know, the 
some of the up and coming musicians that we have in our show have some really great things going on. I mean, we're just either just finishing like their masters or their doctorates who are recording albums. I mean, I wasn't recording an album when I was in grad school or um, like putting like they're putting out tours or successful or, or grant writing. Um, so like that has been awesome. Like some of our um, friends who are killing it, um, you know, Jamandre is our friend, obviously he's killing it, but like some people that you probably are probably not as famous as like a Jamandre Thurman, you know, mm -hmm. um, that are just absolutely amazing and people should know um, what they're doing. Oh, am I missing something? Yeah, I think um, we sort of thought about it, like you mentioned, like the up and coming, the people ran out of school or some of them are still in school. I mean, we uh, interviewed Classically Black, which if you don't know them, oh, you yeah. should, Katie mm -hmm. and Delaney. And <laughs> I didn't know she was an undergrad. Yeah. The whole interview, I'm like, undergrad? Yeah. How is this possible? <laughs> you know? I'm not thinking like that as an undergraduate. <laughs> Okay, and then we have people, of course, who are like us, you know, who are within their careers, and you know, they have wonderful careers already. And then we have the people we want to aspire to, who are already been in the field a long time, have major accomplishments, major wins, Grammy nominations, all of those kinds of things. So I think the different levels is is what makes it interesting because you're looking down and seeing some of these brilliant minds and you're like, wow. What is this going to become in 10 years? And I'm glad you're on my show now because right. I'm going to want this favor 10 years from now. So, so yeah, just that mix of um, people in all different stages of their career and of their lives who can shed wonderful information with ourselves and our audience. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that was a very imprecise answer, yet it was precise. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like there, there's not a – and sometimes a great show will be very specific. You know, I mean, it's like it's people who are in their early 20s who are classical musicians of color who are – and that's that's great, and that's not, that's not good, that's not bad. Uh, sometimes it's only established people, but what you just said, it sounded to me was people that you find remarkable and that you intentionally choose people at each step of the, you know, their journey. Um, and it's just people that are remarkable who have something to say that you want to amplify and that you can learn from. Exactly. Definitely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's been really great to yeah. do that. And then we, we know, we actually start off elevate with just the two of us just right. speaking and talking. And I think we're going to be doing a little more of that in the spring. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be really fun too, is just to have sort of those, I can't say solo episodes, but duo episodes <laughs> where it's just us. Sure. <laughs> um, and then it's, um, also shows where we have uh, other guests that come in with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. I also like how your format is is changing and then it sounds like it's changing again and it's yeah I've you are the first interview that I have done this is my second interview in the pandemic like Ooh. in terms of for TEM where it used to be it was about every two out of every five episodes was but it's just it's I've been doing a lot of episodes at 11 p.m just down here, like in my basement office by myself when everybody else is asleep <laughs> because mm -hmm. my son is doing Spanish immersion first grade online in the living room and I'm the one who's helping him with that and I don't speak Spanish, so that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, and my wife is, uh, sometimes she goes into school where there are no kids to teach from there. Other times she's just up on the third floor teaching middle school band from, uh, you know, it's like, it's kind of all hands on deck right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the format changed because it needed to change. And now I'm swinging back and, uh, you know, I think you're going to be the <clears> first <throat> of many because I've kind of got a little bit of a groove back. But I like how your thing organically went from the two of you to guests. And then there's going to, doesn't sound like you're ditching the guests, but there's, that you realize the two of you have some things to say on your own. And isn't that the beautiful thing about being your own boss? Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you can change the market. You know, when sometimes when you're in an institution, they're kind of, they're slow or yeah. lethargic. Or so, sometimes. Like, oh, sorry. <laughs> right. <No>. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that Pop sounded it. like somebody who's up for tenure, like soon. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> I mean, not mine. You know, mine is, is incredibly nimble. It's 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 inspiring. Yeah, just to even come to work every day with how nimble we are. So, uh, <laughs> oh, so well said. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, as with all of the good guests, 
uh, I there's so many directions I could go in, and I have to, uh, you know, I, I don't know why I don't just like I, I actually verbalize like I don't know what I should ask you next, which I think is probably what you're not supposed to do as an interviewer. But here we are. What is a piece of advice that you regularly give at your arts entrepreneurship clinics? Oh gosh, there's there's so much advice. Um, sure. Like, well, one, just, you know, seek out a mentor um, is is huge. Mm-hmm. I think you know, mentorship is like finding someone that you trust, someone that's going to keep it real with you. Um, and yeah, I mean, that even if that's not your applied teacher, just someone. I mean, that's the cool thing about technology these days. Like you can easily reach out to anyone and just, you know, ask questions and and, you know, just pick their brains. So just like finding a mentor, someone who inspires you, that's going to push you and just keep it real. That's one thing. Yeah, that is one thing. And then we do the nitty gritty, you know, the boring stuff, <laughs> like the CVs, the bios, yeah. the, the boring stuff, like what we were talking about, that actually is the gatekeeper to you even being coming considered that a lot of people don't think about. So mm-hmm. we do do things like that as well, making sure that your materials are clean because if they're not, even if your best friend's in the room, they're gonna have a hard time advocating for you exactly. if it looks really bad. Sure. Um, so so yeah, those 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 two things would be our, our, our biggest tips, I think. Yeah. And I mean, a, a big thing that, you know, like we, we always say there's two different types of people out there. There are doers and there are sayers and like, just be the doer, you know, like don't just say that you're going to get that website out or you're going to record this recording project, like actually back it up because I've known a lot of people who said they were going to do all this stuff and they never do it. And, you know, you're keep doing this, you're just kind of stagnant. So just like make a plan and initiate it and make it happen. Yeah. Uh, and can so- I say an obvious one? Uh, nope, Do I no, have nothing obvious here. here. Only only subtle <laughs> things on TEM. Like we like to keep it a little more highbrow than that, Artina. Oh, All right, okay. just, just, the, just this once. Just this once. Go ahead. <laughs> the really obvious. <laughs> well, to be nice. I think that especially we're, you know, both educators, and sometimes that seems like like something everybody would be doing. But I think a lot of times our students don't know that that's really important, not only to their own colleagues, but to their professors, to other people they interact with. Um, You never know where people are going to end up in their life. And and just like I'm already starting my retirement fund with these up and coming musicians (laughs) banking on 10 years from now, them being amazing and me calling in a favor. I mean, that's really real. And I think as you go through your career, you, you, the people you think like, oh, they'll never, never make it anywhere, become your bosses and they Mm -hmm. become the EDs and the artistic directors. And um, you know, people don't forget stuff. Yep. So uh, I would just make sure that you're always nice and kind. And even like, you know, when you do have something to say, you can say it poignantly, but kindly. Mm-hmm. I saw a, a bumper sticker that was up on uh, someone's office door um, at uh, one of the Smithsonian museums. And uh, the, the sticker said, uh, be kind whenever possible. And there was an asterisk. And then the bottom, the asterisk said, it's always possible. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I like that. Right. Put a, put a fine point on it, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I know yeah. my mom always used to say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And that, mm-hmm. that would be good advice yep. for the times when you feel like you can't be nice, just be quiet. Yep. Yeah. Even even if you're not going to be kind because it's the right thing to do and because it makes the world a better place and because uh, you know social media and everything in the world right now amplifies negative and uh, negativity and hot takes and all of that it's even if you only want to view it selfishly it's just it's it's in my best interest to be nice to both of you right to be kind to both of you because i you know i mean what there's nothing to gain from not being in it to be clear i don't think you should be viewing that through selfishness but even if that's like your only angle it's in your best interest to be kind to everybody all the time or as your mother just said keep your mouth shut right yeah it's, <laughs> it's uh that's not a very uh it's not a very 2020 message but anyway so right. yeah. <laughs> especially if people that look like me online but we'll just move right along we'll just gloss oh, over right. that so another podcast <laughs> yeah that is <laughs> <laughs> that that reminds me, you, you're probably curious of my thought on this thing that I have not experienced or have any firsthand knowledge of, but I'm going to share it with you now. So yeah, yeah, get comfortable. Yeah, that's like basically the internet. Like, yeah, uh, 
anyway, right. moving right along. Um, you all have, um, oh, I wanted to mention about the mentor thing. That's really, yeah, and I like what you just said, uh, Martin, again, a fine point on it, that because of technology, you can reach out to Artina if you are somebody who she is really resonating with. It, you do not need to be a student at the University of Memphis. You do not need to be, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of, it's it's remarkable. I just did a, a TEM coaching session, which I did, um, you know, on the house with a, you know, I, I used to teach at Shenandoah Conservatory. I don't anymore. Uh, a young man who I had in class last year uh, in a uh, in a music business class, he reached out and he is uh, trying to uh, start a podcast. And he is, uh, and it sounds, uh, and shout out to Kapesh, who's probably going to be listening to this. <laughs> and yeah, we, we talked for an hour. I was happy to help him, you know, get this thing off the ground because he is a voice that needs elevating. And I, you know, he's only 20 and he's like really attacking stuff. Uh, yeah, it, but that's the thing. I don't even need to teach there anymore, right? You don't need to wait to run into me in the hallway to ask me. You can ask anybody anything. And when it's thoughtfully done, you're going to get a lot of good responses back. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I hope that, you know, this generation, these early 20s and these late teenagers will start doing that. I think there's a little bit of fear because, I don't know, it looks like, oh, you know, on social media, I don't know if I can send the DM or not. But I, I hope that this is the way of the future, that you just have increased access to so many great minds, so many great thinkers from all across the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and don't don't be scared that uh, you know that uh, either one of the Dr. McCain, right? The doctor can be intimidating, right? Or somebody who is in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra can be intimidating, or somebody who's in the Chrono String Quartet can be into you know when the don't let the titles intimidate you, and don't take and if you're if you're reaching out to people who like the two people I'm talking to right now who are incredibly busy and pulled in a lot of directions. If they don't get back to you, don't take it personally, right? I try to get back to everybody, especially young people that they get in touch with me. But if if they don't, uh, there there's probably a different reason than Artina read your email and she's like, nah, I'm not gonna help this kid out. Yeah, they don't, you know. I mean, there's like, uh, yeah, there's it's probably that life has happened, right? I mean, yep. so you just got to be, you can't let one, uh, not even rejection, right? Because that's not a rejection. That's just a didn't get an email back kind of thing. You got to be more resilient than that. Um, yeah, it's, it's all important. Um, before we run out of time here, I did want to ask you uh, about, uh, you, you mentioned about commissioning and working with composers and um, just uh, your, your thoughts on that, the importance of it, and then how you've gone uh, uh, about doing it. Well, I guess my thoughts um, as, I guess, the bass Ramon player in the, in the group I, when I was in school, I played all all the stuff, you know, like all the standard pieces and whatnot. And, you know, I was I was thinking, all right, there's enough recordings of Eugene Boats's uh, New Orleans. You know, um, there's there's so many recordings. You don't need another one. What could I do to stand out from any other bass from player? Well, you know, like commission, like new new works. And when we were um start doing start doing more touring and when you want we wanted to get more music like we were in school with some great composers and we were starting to meet other um, great composers either at conferences or through acquaintances and like with the music and the music that we love to play like we're classically trained and we love like all different types of music like jazz music gospel so we wanted to start getting these composers to kind of marry all of these genres together that we enjoy and so that's a lot of the type of music that we like to do um, right now and um and you know it's great because we play it at different conferences, we record it, we put it on tour. They love it, they're so appreciative and they continue to write for us. So we have certain composers that we work with a lot um, who are continuing to write for us. And so, yeah, it's just, it's amazing. And just going through the process of actually working with a composer and, and one, just giving them an idea and then see what they come up with. And it's truly collaborative. We can go back and forth, it's been pretty awesome. Yeah, and I, I can just tag on to that. I think Commission is really Martin's brainchild. He's really respected in the field. Um, he has a lot of friends. He's easy to get along with. So people just want to write him stuff, which is good for us because then we don't have to pay for things all the time. So <laughs> uh, again, going back to being nice. Uh, but yeah, I think 
whoever you are, whatever your instrument is making a wide range of connections so that you can pull in those people. It's not that we don't want to pay people. We do want to pay people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's also nice that collaboration, right? Because all composers want somebody to play their music. And so if you already have a friend, Martin already has a friend and they have a good relationship, that's a win-win. We played at a conference. Somebody wants to buy the score. Mm -hmm. That's how you get yourself out there. Mm. I just heard a few things that I love is that you wanted to, first of all, uh, Lance LaDuke, my co-host on the Brass Junkies and partner here at Pedal Note Media, what he, he and I both almost never play standard rap for euphonium and tuba, like in recitals. And he, he put it into words. And when he said it, I was like, that's exactly what I think. I just hadn't really, you know, quantified it. I just don't really feel like I have anything to add. Like, which is what you just said with recite, and not that I, not that my version isn't different, and not that it's just like it's not burning a, a hole in my creative pocket for me to like put my own spin. There's a few exceptions, like the the Penderecki Capriccio, I love, like, and that's a standard. Like, but I, I feel like I have something to say with that. I, th I feel like my version is is unique enough. Um, well, you're either unique or you're not unique. I just totally butchered the definition <laughs> of that word. But yeah, I think you know what I'm saying, right? Like, I have something to say with that piece, and some of them I just like. Like the Vaughn Williams, I don't need to ever play again. I mean, and, and I like it. The second movement's beautiful, but like I I don't know that I really have that much more to add there. And so you have the self-awareness to realize that you've played everything and that the world doesn't need another recording of New Orleans. Uh, but then you did something about it, which is that you you not only created new works, but you created new works that meld the things that you're interested in, which is tie back to the grant writing process, right? Where you t you spoke about, if you speak passionately about what you do and it aligns with the organization that you're trying to get money from, those are the those are the grant applications that make it either all the way through the gauntlet or most of the way through the gauntlet. And you're now having the world create art that really shows you and her and the two of you as three separate entities off, which is like already that's way more interesting to me than hearing me even play the crap out of the Von Williams when I don't really have that much to say, <laughs> right? Like in terms of right. as an audience member, that's awesome. It's really good. I love how you just said that. Yeah. You're hired. You're our new PR person. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> that was great I'm going to go back, listen to this, and take that tag. I've for never, funny. I've never, uh, I've never done a TEM episode and then afterwards send an invoice. This is going to be a little awkward, but you know, I'm going to, I'm totally going to do it. I'm just going to send you a bill uh, for my, like, oh, you thought you were being interviewed. This was a TEM coaching hour. So yeah, like, um, no, but, but, and that's, and that's what you just said, right? I mean, you're, you're creating your own thing. And that's, uh, yeah, I, there are so many, um, there are so many bass trombone. There are not a thousand people in the world or even close to it of people that can play the bass trombone as well as you can, Martin. Uh, same with piano and Artina, although there are a lot more piano players. Uh, but the thing that Artina has over everyone else is that you're Artina, right? I mean, you're, you're happiest, you're saddest, the most scared you've ever been. Like all of that is like, even if Martin was next to you for all of those, he wasn't you. He wasn't living, you know, that's the part. And that's what we got to get as, uh, as musicians. And then we've got to figure out as entrepreneurs, how we can get all of that, those experiences front and center with people. And that's exactly what you're doing by creating repertoire that is tailored to you as musicians and as artists. I, yeah, it's, I, I applaud you. We need more of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yes, yes. So what's next for the, the McCain duo? I mean, it's, I mean, we're obviously in the middle of the pandemic. There is a vaccine, although I'm guessing that you have not had it yet since this is still, you know, like frontline, uh, frontline workers. Um, and uh, yeah, the LA Times story last week of the rich people who are offering to donate $25,000 to hospitals to jump the line had me uh, like go into the woods and behind my house so my kid couldn't hear me and scream some words that I won't scream into this oh. microphone. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that you haven't tried to skip the line either. So none of us are vaccinated yet here. Right. Um, the, uh, the, and you also don't seem like reprehensible humans. So you also wouldn't have done that even if you had the money. But moving right along, um, what what's next for you all? Like, uh, you know, either, either now or once we get through this, uh, you know, in a year, two years, whenever it's going to be back to normal. So is this where we do all the shameless plugs? Yes, please <laughs> plug away. Plug Just away. Because <laughs> earlier away. I was like, oh, I guess I can't do all the shameless plugs here. But if I can, I will tell you. <laughs> you you have the green light, please. Yay, yay, yay. 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, when we, I mean, Martin has already plugged our new Elevate series in the mm -hmm. spring. That'll mm -hmm. be coming out probably in February. Um, we're really um, overjoyed to be doing a lot of virtual things. I know a lot of musicians haven't had any things and we've been really blessed to have a lot of virtual opportunities. So one of them is we're doing the Music Teachers National Association Conference in March. So that will mm -hmm. be virtual. I know it's more of a piano thing, but you know, Martin has bust down the door of a <laughs> piano conference to be a trombone headliner. So that's actually really a great yeah. opportunity for both of us and for brass players. That's great. Uh, I, I will be quiet and I'll let you do other plugs. No, no, it's <laughs> great. Um, we also have like another album that's going to be coming out. Uh, we're going to be going into the studio in the next couple of months. Um, it's going to be all sacred music, but like the sacred music with the type of music that we said that we like to enjoy playing. So it's going to be jazz, um, influenced um, as well as like the classical influenced. And so that's exciting. We got some of our favorite composers to write um, new arrangements for us. And so we're so excited about that. And hopefully the goal is for that album to come out by the time of MCNA. And we're doing a couple of university virtual residencies since we can't travel right now, but it's still great to still be able to do, do that. Um, we've been doing a lot of video recording projects. So, um, so those videos will be going out um, as well. So am I missing anything? Yeah, and a lot of our virtual projects are, are not just like the kind of old school, oh, we're going to play a recital, but we want to do conversations yeah, or having a, you know, um, mentorship with the students that are there and also, you know, really pertinent discussions for our times, mm -hmm. social issues that are happening and, and how musicians can overcome those things. So it's performance and educational, just right. like what we do in our YouTube channel and, and all of our other outside of the institution work. So it's going to be a really great great time in 2021 yeah. because that's what we're hoping for because 2020 <laughs> is taking the cake yeah, for a lot of us exactly. <laughs> a friend of mine really took the wind out of my sails when when they tweeted recently they said they said everybody does realize that on january 1st 2021 the world is still gonna suck right right, right. <laughs> exactly. i don't want to say it we want to just imagine at least the number changed though i don't know and, and it's not like that was like a hot take i mean i know that that's the case but it still was just kind of like you know we've all been like this year needs to just go away like forever and ever and ever like we should never speak of this ever again and it's like yeah well yeah i don't i don't know if it's uh i don't know how different i'm going to feel the next morning but we'll see right. I'm gonna, I should, <laughs> at least this, number change <laughs> yeah well, at least there's a number change so with this attitude it's i think i've uh, hardwired that i'm not going to feel any different but uh <laughs> hopefully hopefully i'm wrong those are not words i say often so um the uh, we are we i say we it's like uh, it's me uh, i will uh i'm trying to make it sound like we got this huge team over here like all of my people uh we will link to the uh to your youtube channel to the the elevate series to all of that in the show notes uh, which is always are at tem.fm uh, and there's a, a you know a link uh, to that uh, to the show notes uh, in the uh, in the notes of this and whatever podcast app you are listening to this and uh, we are going to I, say, I keep saying we what is wrong with me I'm, I'm losing I'm, I'm having a nervous breakdown during an interview this is fun uh, we I me they are going to have uh, Artina and Martin stick around uh, for the bonus episode which will be available for Patreon patrons which you can go to patreon.com slash TEM podcast to uh, to become a Patreon patron and unlock a whole bunch of bonus content uh, one thing I'm going to ask you about is your personal creative rhythms and in terms of like what time of day maybe you're more productive and then how maybe that lines up or doesn't and and maybe some resource recommendations for entrepreneurs and we'll kind of let that go wherever it's going to go but again you can get through that at uh patreon.com and uh, i think that that's it this has been wonderful thank uh, thank you so much uh, for both of your times it's great to see you as always martin and it's great to meet you artina and i'm really looking forward to to what you all have in store in 2021 and beyond thank you so hey, much Andrew. thanks andrew and that is going to do it for another episode of the entrepreneurial musician mm -hmm.